Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture. I'm Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the sponsors for tonight's event, the Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the General Society of Colonial Wars. Thank you again for joining us for tonight's lecture, Masters of the Middle Waters, Indian Nations and Colonial Ambitions Along the Mississippi. It is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jacob Lee. Jacob Lee is an assist assistant professor of history at Pennsylvania State University, a historian of early America and the American West. He received fellowships from the Huntington Library, the Newberry Library, the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley for his work on this book. We are proud to claim him among our Filson staff alumni, and he is the author of one of the most important articles in the 20 year run of Ohio Valley history, whether it really be truth or fiction, Colonel Reuben T. Durrett, the Filson Club and historical memory in postbellum Kentucky. I'll moderate questions after the presentation as time permits, but now please join me in welcoming Jacob Lee. Thank you, Patrick, for that generous introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the Filson for inviting me to come speak with you all tonight. I wanna thank uh, Scott and all the people behind the scenes for uh, making sure this goes smoothly and getting me uh, in a place where I can, I can, I can speak with you all tonight. Um, and uh, as Patrick mentioned, I, um, I did spend a, you know five years at the at the Filson working in special collections, and uh, that makes tonight uh, particularly exciting for me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be back. Um, my only regret is that it could not be in person, but I'm I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak with you, uh, even remotely. Um, and so, uh, as Patrick mentioned, I am going to talk about uh, my book. Uh, Masters of the Middle Waters, uh, Indian Nations and Colonial Ambitions Along the Mississippi. And I want to start off tonight by giving you a little bit of an overview of the book, and then I want to focus on one story that highlights the book's two central themes. Uh, Masters of the Middle Waters examines efforts by Indian nations as well as European and Euro-American empires to exert authority over the central Mississippi River Valley. There we are. Um, and, and the Central Mississippi River Valley is the confluence of many of the continent's largest and most important rivers. Uh, they're a defining part of the landscape and a key part of my research. Uh, the Mississippi, of course, but also the Missouri and the Ohio flow into the uh, Mississippi there and the Illinois, Wabash, Tennessee and Cumberland rivers are all nearby. Uh, the story largely focuses on three groups of people in this region. Um, the three groups of native people, I should say. The Illinois nation, whose homelands are centered in um, what is now what's now called the Illinois River. Uh, you can see it marked there on the map where I'm moving the cursor. Uh, to the west is the Osage nation, who lived in the present day states of Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And to the south, the Chickasaws of present day Mississippi. And those Indian nations were, for the bulk of the, of the time period that I'm studying between the 1600s, well, roughly between the 1600s and the early 1800s, uh, those three polities are really the, the main uh, groups in terms of who controls this region. Um, but their dominance in the region was also challenged by four empires. Uh, France, Spain, Great Britain, and the United States all claimed part or all of this region during that time period to varying degrees of success. And my book has two central themes. First, I argue that Indians and, and colonists alike organized society around kinship, and that they understood that the bonds of kinship, especially those of marriage and adoption, reinforced political, economic, and military alliances, both between families and clans and nations, um, or I should say between all of those. And these kinship networks often developed along the region's waterways because most economic, military, and political activity in Middle America took place along those rivers, commanding those conduits allowed Native peoples and Europeans to vie for status, influence, and wealth by, um, uh, along them, 
Second, uh, over the course of about 600 years from the fall of the ancient city of Cahokia, uh, which is uh, just east of present day St. Louis, to the rise of the United States at the turn of the 19th century, waves of native peoples, missionaries, traders, settlers, and imperialists attempted to remake the Mississippi Valley to suit their interests. In each instance, the past influenced the new regime. The French Empire came into the, the mid-continent in the 1600s and attempted to append itself to the native political landscape. And its efforts to control the region hinged on established relationships between Indian nations, as much as on interactions between those nations and the French. When Spain and Great Britain replaced France in the 1760s, they discovered that the actions and policies of their predecessors had forged a political landscape that needed to be navigated as carefully as the rivers of the physical landscape. And then at the turn of the 19th century, Americans believed that the United States and its experiment in republicanism stood apart from its Indian imperial predecessors. But as much as they pretended otherwise, Americans built their empire atop the remnants of French, British, and Spanish colonies on a continent still largely dominated by native peoples. And tonight I want to focus on one story that highlights both of these themes, both the importance of kinship and kinship networks used to control the, the rivers in the landscape of the mid-continent, but also the importance of continuity from one imperial regime to the next, uh, as native peoples uh, make this transition uh, in dealing with different empires, as different empires attempt to assert authority over this region. And we're going to, to look at a moment in 1760, starting in 1763 at the conclusion of the Seven Years' War, when France ceded its claims to its North American colonies to Great Britain and to Spain. The colony of Louisiana, which had stretched up the Mississippi River from the Gulf of Mexico to the Illinois country, became divided with Great Britain claiming the lands in the pinkish color there on the east side of the river and Spain claiming those on the west. British officials soon focused on taking possession of the French towns of the Illinois country. And you can see them laid out here along the river from uh, Cahokia down to uh, Prairie du Rocher uh, in Kaskaskia. And the Illinois country is really important to the British for a couple of reasons. One is that this is the, now the Western boundary of the British imperial claims in North America. And the British want to control this site, both to prevent um, um, people from the Spanish side crossing over, uh, but also to uh, keep an eye out for any military threat from Spain and from its uh, from its outposts on the west side of the river. The other thing that they wanted to do is take control of the region's fur trade, which had been very lucrative throughout the first part of the 1700s, and, um, but had been oriented south down the Mississippi River uh, to New Orleans for uh, largely for reasons of transportation, right? It's very easy to go down the Mississippi River um, and get your furs out to port, but that leaves them largely in control of the Spanish empire and the British are hoping in the 1760s that they can siphon off that trade and redirect it back toward, back toward British colonies farther east. And so there's this moment in 1763 when uh, Britain has you know, been ceded this a claim to this territory by France. Um, but at exactly that moment, Indians across the mid-continent launch a war against these would-be conquerors. In May and June of 1763, indigenous forces seized nine British forts and threatened half a dozen others in the Great Lakes and the Upper Ohio Valley. These coordinated attacks stretch from the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania backcountry to Southern Lake Michigan. And by July of 1763, British troops controlled only three forts west of the Appalachians, Detroit, Fort Pitt, and Niagara. Over the next year, this alliance expanded. By the spring of 1764, it controlled the Ohio, the Wabash, the Illinois, and large parts of the, Mill of the Mississippi rivers, 
And these rivers are essential to British ambitions in the region because they are the waterways that connected the Illinois country to the Atlantic coast. Without access to those, the British Empire cannot reach this land that it supposedly owns under its treaty with, with France. This conflict that I'm describing is now usually referred to as Pontiac's War. It's named after an Ottawa war chief uh, named Pontiac, and he is the man that British observers largely credit with leading this alliance. Now, this, um, th this moment catches the British off guard. The British come out of the Seven Years' War uh, this long conflict with France that is really um, in North America is just one part of a, of a global conflict that stretches to Europe and as far away as India. Um, but they come out of this war victorious. France has left North America. France has given up its claims. And British uh, officials in North America and in Great Britain see this as a, a, an incredible victory. And they think that they have defeated both France and the native peoples of North America. And this turns out very much to not be the case. And so British officials are struggling to figure out what has happened in the summer of 1763. This again comes as a great surprise that they have lost the vast majority of their forts west of the Appalachian Mountains, that Detroit and Fort Pitt are both under siege and are, uh, the British are struggling to resupply them. And the British soon focus on Pontiac as the Alliance's key leader. And partly this is because of the way that British military and diplomatic uh, leaders think about leadership. They assume that there is one person calling the shots. They assume that there is one person directing all of the action. And that uh, it is, a you know, if you think about the, the British military, it's very, of course, top down. You know, you say, you know, this is what's happening and then people have to do that. And that's not how authority works in native communities. That's not how native peoples build alliances. That's not how native peoples put together the kind of alliance that is capable of launching a coordinated attack against the vast part or against the vast uh, swath of territory stretching from Fort Pitt to Lake Michigan. And so British officials though, they say, well, Pontiac, he must be a particularly charismatic leader. He must be a great man, you know, meaning in the, the sense of a, of a great and talented leader. British General Thomas Gage says that Pontiac was an enterprising man who he believed had bullied other nations to joining his cause. And his solution initially was very simple. He said, we will invite Pontiac to a meeting, we will surprise him, and we will put him and his crew uh, all to the sword. He believes that if you can kill Pontiac, you can kill the, this, this uprising. But as I've mentioned, Gage and other British officers misunderstood both Pontiac and the source of his influence. First, the British overstated Pontiac's role as a central leader. He was one of many chiefs, men of one of many warriors whose influence united the nativists. And just as importantly, as, as we'll talk about more in just a second, is that his influence depends upon kinship ties, which also means that the networks that he is drawing on are of both men and women, right? That, that this is not uh, a system of influence and power that is based on male, solely on male military might. It's also based on who you're related to, who are you married to, who do you have alliances with, who are you, uh, who trusts you enough to launch this kind of, a, of war. And this is the key thing about Pontiac, is that he is important, but it's not because of his personal charisma or because of his personal uh, skill. It is largely because he has kinship ties throughout the Great Lakes and the Illinois country. So who was Pontiac? Pontiac was an Ottawa man who rose to prominence as a war leader during the Seven Years' War. 
uh, during his time, and which he mostly spent in the upper Ohio Valley during the conflict in the 1750s and 1760s, he developed close relations with Delaware and Shawnee Indians who were fighting the British settlers who had invaded their homelands in present day Pennsylvania. And sometime during this period, um, Pontiac meets a Delaware prophet, a Delaware religious leader named Neolin. And Neolin is, he carries a, a, a relatively new message, one that started to develop in the 1730s, but then really comes into fruition at the end of the 1750s with uh, Neolin and a handful of other prophets carrying the message. And Neolin's, uh, Neolin's preaching focused on two things. One is separating from Europeans. He saw Europeans as dangerous. He saw their influence as malicious and malignant. And he wanted native peoples to stop trading with Europeans. He wanted native peoples to largely cut themselves off from uh, European influence. And the second thing that he advocated was forging a new unity among the diverse nations of Eastern North America. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that there is no identity of Native American or Indian in this time period. Native peoples understand themselves to be members of clans, to be members of Indian nations, of individual nations, but they don't have uh, a, an identity as Indians. And this is something that Neolin is consciously trying to create. And so in this moment, we also start to see lots of rhetoric about unity among the quote unquote red men uh, spoken by people like Neolin and people like Pontiac. And, and it's important to understand that this is a huge shift. This is asking people to take on a new identity unlike anything that they had seen before because it is asking people to understand that they're connected not based on their, their direct family ties or the membership in, in an Indian nation, but that they have this broader pan-Indian identity. And Neolin uh, begins to attract significant numbers of Delaware and Shawnee followers in the late 1750s and into the early 1760s, in large part because those nations had had a significant, um, a significant experience with Europeans and particularly with dispossession by the English. Uh, a series of treaties which Delawares and Shawnees disputed in the 1730s and 1740s led to antagonisms between them and the colony of Pennsylvania. And because of that dispossession, because of the negative influence uh, and negative effects, I should say, of, of colonization in Pennsylvania, they are willing to uh, accept this new message as part of a strategy of resistance. And Pontiac also takes up this message, and no later than 1762, he begins, he begins spreading Neolin's message uh, from its, its roots in kind of Western Pennsylvania in Eastern Ohio to his relatives in the Great Lakes, um, Ojibwe's uh, on Lake Huron and Potawatomi's on uh, Lake Michigan. And he also begins spreading it down the Wabash River to members of the Miami nation, uh, the Miamis, the Weas, Piankashaws, and the Kickapoos who are closely aligned with the Weas. In this coalition of Shawnees, of Delawares, of Ottawa's, Ojibwe's, Potawatomi's, and Miami's is really the core of the alliance that launches the war in, uh, against Great Britain in 1763. And I want to highlight um, just really quick something important about the way this is stretching along the waterways of Middle America. Because the Shawnees and Delawares are close to the headwaters of the, um, of the Ohio River, and they are downstream from Fort Pitt, which is the, as you may recall, is the last British fort still standing in the Ohio River Valley, and then you have Detroit uh, farther north. The other waterway that is really important that 
uh, Pontiac and his alliance now control is the Wabash River, which is one of the primary waterways that connects the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, coming out of Lake Erie, there is a river that flows uh, west, or actually it flows east into the river, but you can follow it west uh, to near present day Fort Wayne. You take a short portage, uh, just a few miles into the Wabash River Valley, and then you can go all the way down to the Ohio River at present day Vincennes, which then takes you to the Mississippi. And so this is a crucial waterway uh, for communication between the Mississippi River Valley and the Great Lakes. And now native peoples, Miami's in particular, allied with Pontiac control that. And so there's a, there's a, a, a geographical thinking going on with the alliance building here that Pontiac and his allies are cutting off any additional British access to the interior of the, of the continent. And this is, this is where things stand at the end of 1763. Pontiac and his allies have driven significant numbers of, um, uh, of, have taken control of significant numbers of British forts. There are some left standing, but then this war turns into a stalemate in that winter of 1763-1764. Pontiac and his allies could not take the last remaining forts, but neither could the British move beyond them. And Pontiac in this moment looks to expand his alliance and he looks toward the Illinois country. He, he sees this as, he sees the Illinois Indians as a potential ally. And at first glance, Illinois Indians seemed an unlikely ally. And, and they seem unlikely for two reasons. One is that unlike Shawnees and Delawares, the Illinois Indians and other nations in the Mississippi Valley had not yet lost most of their land to settler colonialism. And prior to 1763, they had pretty limited contact with the British more generally. But the second thing is that significant numbers of Illinois Indians, especially Kaskaskias, which is one of the subdivisions of the Illinois nation, had converted to Catholicism in large numbers in the late 1600s and early 1700s. And in general, Neolin has very little success converting Catholics to embrace his new message. And so initially we think, historians have thought that, that the Illinois Indians had little use for Neil and, and, and for Pontiac based on the reaction of Catholic Indians uh, elsewhere in the Great Lakes. But in other ways, the Illinois Indians are ideal recipients for this message because since the pre-colonial era, era, Illinois had intermarried with neighboring nations to further their political and economic goals. They had uh, intermarried uh, Piankish with Piankishaws, Miamis, Weas, Kickapoos, Missourias, and Osages. And during the 17th century, Illinois nation, the Illinois traded with all of those nations. And beginning late in the 1600s, those nations all fought together against Fox Indians uh, west of Lake Michigan and Chickasaw Indians in present day Mississippi. And so the, there's a really strong history uh, among the Illinois nation of building this kind of multi-ethnic alliance. And so in April of 1764, Pontiac goes to the Illinois country, intending to draw on this history and to convince the Illinois and their allies to join the war against the British. And Pontiac has, uh, has an advantage in this because he has married an Illinois woman. In later years, uh, British reports document Pontiac regularly traveling along the Wabash River between his home in Detroit and his wife's family in the Illinois country. And so by April of 1764, he may have already been a familiar face among the Illinois and his familial ties may have served as a key, um, key selling point to these allies who otherwise would have been uh, reluctant to join him. And these kinship ties, uh, I think, are, are, uh, are a crucial thing to understand about Pontiac's influence in his, in his uh, success in extending his, his alliance in the spring of 1764. Uh, so the, we also need to keep in mind that there's another source of influence here, or there's, there's another group of people trying to exert influence here, and that is the French. Because despite the fact that the 
uh, Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763. The British still have not been able to go to the Illinois country to take formal possession of this region from the French. And so the French uh, military officers from the last years of the Seven Years' War are still in, um, still in the Illinois country at Fort de Chartres. And Pierre-Joseph Neon de Villiers, who's the French commandant in the Illinois country, he is desperately trying to convince the Illinois Indians and other nations in the region to reject Pontiac and to reject Neolin's message. He says uh, repeatedly throughout this time that he's writing to these nations, he's speaking with their leaders and trying to get them to stay at peace because the French want to fulfill the terms of their treaty. They are ready to abandon uh, their colonies, they're ready to abandon their forts, hand it over to the British and go somewhere else. And so the, the British think that the French are helping people like Pontiac when actually they are urging them to seek peace. Um, and so these messages are coming into the Illinois country at the same time with Neon de Villiers saying, you have to maintain peace. The British are just like us. The British are going to treat you well. And Pontiac saying, it's time to unite together against the, the British. And Pontiac comes in and he says, you know, the British came to us as conquerors. They said that Indian warriors were like a lump of earth, which they break in their hands and give to the winds to blow away like dust. He says they did not respect us. They, they cut off trade with us. He says, but now we have shown them how strong we are. We have surrounded Detroit and now the British are seeking peace. And he says, but we have refused this. He says, we will not finish the war with the English while there remains one of us red men. In response, Neon de Villiers repeated his pleas for Pontiac to end the war and for the Illinois Indians to befriend both the British and the French. Pontiac uh, interrupts him and he says, I will not make peace with the British, I hate them. And he says, moreover, this peace, if it is made, will not hold more than 40 months, since it is true, these are the sentiments of all thy red children. And so what we can see here is that Pontiac is using this language of pan-Indian unity, but the thing that makes the difference really is this kinship tie through his wife uh, to, the, to the Illinois people. And despite Neon de Villiers' pleas, the Illinois respond positively to Pontiac's message. And a few days after the council, Neon de Villiers reports that the Illinois had sided with Pontiac. He wrote, the arrival of Pontiac has destroyed in one night what I had accomplished in eight months. And so with this council in the spring of 1764, Pontiac extends his alliance once again, this time all the way to the Mississippi River. And this is an important turning point uh, for the expansion of Pontiac's alliance because it gives the, this alliance a foothold on the Mississippi, but more importantly, it opens up a whole new set of alliance networks for uh, Pontiac to um, spread his message along. And so to the west of the Illinois country, shortly after this um, council, the Little Osages and Missouri Indians, both on the Missouri River, they joined the Illinois and they said that they followed, quote, the sentiments of all the red men. Messengers from the Illinois country then contacted Quapaw Indians living uh, in present day Arkansas. It's kind of at the confluence of the Arkansas River with the Mississippi. And Quapaws then contacted Tunica, Ophogula, and Avoyel Indians uh, down near uh, present day Louisiana. And so by the winter of 1764, Pontiac had utilized kinship ties to build a sprawling anti-colonial alliance throughout the waterways of Middle America. And by controlling the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, he and his allies commanded the routes to the Illinois country. The British are unable to take possession of this part of their, of what they believe is their empire. So I wanna pause here and turn to what the British are doing in this moment. Because the British are still confident in their military might. They are still uh, 
assured that this is not a real threat, that they can send armies into the mid-continent, they can defeat Pontiac and his allies and take possession of this part of their empire. And in 1763, General Jeffrey Amherst, one of the most arrogant people in the history of North America, determines to bludgeon Pontiac's alliance into submission with a two-pronged attack. He sends one army into the upper Ohio Valley uh, that he expects will defeat Shawnees and Delawares, and he sends another force of a few hundred soldiers up the Mississippi River from New Orleans toward the Illinois country. Neither of these succeed. Uh, the convoy from New Orleans only makes a couple hundred miles upriver before the southern part of Pontiac's alliance, the Tunicas and Ophogulas, attack the alliance and force it, or I'm sorry, attack the convoy and force it to turn back. And the, um, the uh, campaign into the upper Ohio, Ohio Valley also does not achieve the military success that Amherst predicts. Amherst, however, is not around to see this because he has already been replaced by the British government who are fed up with him and his mounting failures. And they replace him with General Thomas Gage. And Gage sees the military defeats that Amherst had planned and recognizes that diplomacy will have to be his primary tool. And Gage soon finds entry points and weaknesses in the alliance that Pontiac has built. And he, decide, and he figures out ways to exploit these entry points. Because one thing that we need to realize also is that despite their vast reach, the kinship networks that connected the diverse nations of the mid-continent were both inclusive and exclusive. And so, Native peoples like the Illinois, like the Quapaws, for that matter, like the Miamis, are joining Pontiac because of their connections to these other nations who are allied with him or to Pontiac directly. But there are also nations who have been in conflict with the Illinois, with the Miamis, with the Ottawas uh, for decades or for centuries who are not interested in joining this alliance and who actively reject this message. And so one thing that I want us to, to keep in mind is that even though Neolin and Pontiac are talking about all Native peoples joining together, in reality what is happening is that Pontiac is uniting groups that are already connected by kinship uh, more so than he is converting them to this new message uh, because the, the nations that they don't have the, these ties with do not join. And so to the west of Lake Michigan, we could talk about Fox and Sauk Indians who had been at war with uh, Ottawas and Otto Ojibwe's and Potawatomi's uh, for decades. And their deepest animosity, though, is for the Illinois Indians. During the 1760s, a Sauk war chief said that they were at perpetual war with the Illinois and that that war would endure as long as the sun, moon, and stars. He said that this nation cannot make peace with the Illinois. His nation could not make peace with the Illinois. He said, for was it possible our bones should beat after death, they would fight together till they would be broke to pieces. And so Sox and Foxes are not interested in joining Pontiac's coalition, especially not once the Illinois join. And um, instead, they go to Thomas Gage and say, we are resolved to remain always in your interest and die with you. And Sauk and Fox Indians help a, a small garrison of British soldiers evacuate uh, their fort at Green Bay at the beginning of Pontiac's War. And so there are Native peoples who are not interested in joining this alliance, and they see their interests best served by aiding the British. The same thing is true south of the Ohio River, where Chickasaws and Cherokees had been at war with the uh, Ottawas and Miamis and Illinois also for decades. And there's, they don't see any common cause with Pontiac or with Neolin. And so the British focus their efforts in part on these nations that they understand are already antagonistic to Pontiac and to the nations that he has gathered in this coalition. Now, Gage also turns away from the military to the British Indian Department, uh, which is the imperial office responsible for negotiating with Indian nations. The Indian Department was led in the North by Sir William Johnson and in the South by John Stuart. Uh, 
And both of these men have their own kinship ties to Native communities. Sir William Johnson married Molly Brant, a, a, a Mohawk woman from a prestigious clan. Um, Mohawks are part of the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, John Stewart married Susanna Emery, a Cherokee woman. And so both of them have kinship ties with nations that they can draw on uh, in service of the British Empire. And they also hire men who, in the words of one of their subordinates, were well acquainted with the Indians' custom, manners, and policies. And in the North, which is where I want to focus more of our time for the next few minutes, uh, Sir William Johnson relies, and then by extension, Thomas Gage, rely heavily on an Irish-born fur trader and diplomat named George Crowen. And George Crowen um, had strong connections to Shawnees and Delawares. He had traded with them as far back as the 1740s. And Gage wants Crowen to re revitalize these connections. And he wants Crowen to go west and to promise good trade with the English. He wants to uh, promise them peace, that they're not going to seek more land from these uh, nations. And he also, in particular, wants him to highlight that in 1763, King George III had banned Anglo settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains. And I want to take a couple minutes to look at the instructions that Gage writes about this mission. And so he says, Mr. Crowen will prevail upon some of the principal chiefs of the Shawnees and Delawares to go with you to the Illinois, to inform those nations, as well as others whom you may pass, that the English have made peace with them and all the other nations with whom they were at war. So again, thinking geographically, let's, you know, the Shawnees and Delawares are up here on the, up in the upper Ohio Valley. This is where Crowen is going to go first, partly because of his uh, pre-existing connections with them, and partly because that's where you have to go if you're trying to get in the Ohio Valley at this point. The next part, though, is he says, and I'm going to summarize here, he says the Shawnees and Delawares will introduce you to the several nations on the Wabash River, will uh, facilitate negotiations, and then you will get some of the Wabash chiefs to go with you to the Illinois country. And then he says, the Illinois Indians, if reconciled, will be easily brought to send chiefs with messages to the Quapaws to acquaint them of their treaty with us and prevail on them to do the same and give us no interruption in our passage up by their villages. And so what Gage is doing here is he is attempting to use the connections that had united Pontiac's coalition to bring it apart to use Crowen's connections to the Shawnees and Delawares to recruit them into an alliance with the British Empire, to use the Shawnees and Delawares to bring in the Miamis, to use the Miamis to bring in the Illinois, use the Illinois to bring in the Quapaws. And at the same time, John Stewart in the South has already made peace with the Tunicas and Ophagulas. And so Pontiac's alliance is slowly falling apart if this plan works, which it does. And in late summer of 1765, Pontiac and Illinois leaders traveled to the Wabash River, they met with Crowen, and they brokered a peace. And at the same time, John Stewart has recruited uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee nations into the, uh, into the alliance. They have agreed to allow safe passage to British troops through their country into the mid-continent, and they have also promised to send co uh, contingents of warriors to accompany the British expedition up the Mississippi River. And this ends Pontiac's war. The British do not succeed militarily, but they succeed through diplomacy in uh, breaking apart the coalition that Pontiac has built, largely using the same techniques that Pontiac had used in the first place to build the coalition. And so at the end of 1765, the British are finally able to take possession of the French towns and of Fort Bichart in the Illinois country, about two and a half years after the signing of the Treaty of Paris. And in unraveling Pontiac's alliance, Thomas Gage demonstrated a keen understanding of the politics in the mid-continent. And it's important to know that Thomas Gage had no firsthand knowledge of this. Um, he lived in New York City, that's where his headquarters were, um, but he recognized that he didn't know the 
he didn't know the country, he didn't know the people. And so he relied on the, the people in the Indian department, William Johnson, John Stewart, their subordinates, to inform him and base a plan on that. And he, and in particular, the, the kinship ties that those agents had developed over the course of years and decades working on behalf of the Indian department. And so he erodes Pontiac's alliance slowly by using these same kinship networks. But once the British are at Fort Deschartes, or as they called it, Fort Charters, the successful diplomacy of 1764 and 1765 began to falter. In counteracting the alliance that Pontiac had built, George Crowan and John Stuart had gained support from their Indian friends and relatives. And as their successes in those years demonstrated, Crowan and Stuart were both very effective. But each man's influence was confined to a finite region. Crowan had his strongest connections in the upper Ohio Valley. Stuarts were in the south. And so they don't have, the British Empire does not have direct connections to the Illinois, to the Miamis, to the Osages. And they, and they will have to construct those if they are going to uh, maintain an alliance, maintain peace. And even more troubling from the perspective of Illinois Indians, for example, the British are closely allied with the Illinois' enemies, the Chickasaws. And so there is a tension here that the British will have to overcome if they wanted to. But there's also a problem with the way the British operate because they, um, the, the conflict during 17, from 1763 to 1765 had heightened Britain's mistrust of both the French and of the native peoples of the mid-continent. And so, as I mentioned early on, from the very beginning of the conflict, British officers wrongly believed that the French had instigated the war. And so once they were in the Illinois country at the end of 1765, they dismissed uh, the remaining French soldiers who had stayed behind uh, rather than go home, well, they stayed home rather than go to France where many of them had never been in the first place, um, but they stayed in the Illinois country and the British showed up and said, you have to leave. And so they moved across the river to Spanish Louisiana. And so they've alienated the people who could serve the same role as Crowan and Stewart did elsewhere. And they also um, are, and that puts them at a disadvantage when it comes to building ties with Indian nations. And so the first co uh, British commander of uh, the Illinois country is a guy named Robert Farmer. And as one of his fellow officers said at the, be at the beginning of his uh, tenure, he says, he is himself a good deal of stranger seemingly to the laws, customs, and disposition of the French, and he and every person with him entirely so to dealing with Indians. And so they have deployed someone who, as it says also, can't communicate in French, uh, does not have a, an interpreter to make himself understood to the native peoples of the region, and doesn't really know what he's doing. And this really sets the tone for much of what follows. The British ambitions for the Illinois country never succeed on the level that they hope. They had alienated both native peoples and the remaining French colonists uh, in the Illinois country. They never get a foothold in the fur trade, which remains firmly in French and native hands. And by 1768, Thomas Gage had all but given up on the region. He writes uh, during that time period, the Illinois has been a gulf that has swallowed up everything and returned nothing back. In 1772, he orders that Fort Deschartes be abandoned and destroyed. And other than a small force at Kaskaskia, the British retreated to Fort Pitt. And so just to, just to highlight some, some key themes again here, is that I think that the story of Pontiac's War, both its early successes and its eventual end, are the story of the power of kinship-based alliance networks to control vast swaths of territory. Pontiac and his allies built a vast alliance that prevented the British from taking possession of the region for more than two years, and they did so using kinship ties, using uh, you know, these intermarried nations that had been alive for decades and centuries. But the complex nature of those ties also allowed British diplomats to draw on their own networks to chip away at Pontiac's influence and eventually for British forces to reach the Illinois country. 
And in this way, Pontiac's War serves as a microcosm of the broader history that I tell in this book. Over many centuries, ambitious individuals, families, and nations are all using these strategies of alliance building through kinship, of trying to control the waterways, all as avenues to gain wealth and power. So thank you for your time, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pause there. Well, thank you so much for uh, for that really fantastic presentation. I, for one, really enjoyed the maps. I love seeing those networks as they extended out um, and and went down the uh, the river. We have a lot of really excellent questions. I would remind everyone, please do put them in the chat. You can also put them into the Facebook Live, and we'll get them into the chat so that I can see them. And hopefully, we'll be able to answer um, quite a few. I know we have had a few. Um, this being a, a primarily Louisville audience about the, the Cron family and eventually that, that branch of the family that ends up at Locust Grove. Can you describe those connections? So this is, this is an, an interesting question, is in that I'm not sure exactly how they are linked. Um, it, you know, in, in terms of more direct rays, like mm. there is Family connection, I you know, like an uncle or nephew or something, but it doesn't, but it doesn't seem like, um, it doesn't seem like there is a, a, a long-standing influence in mm. the in the way that um, you might like to see, and, and if you're if you're you know kind of trying to connect this to the later history of Kentucky, yeah, and I so think... and and so I know that William Cron is a, um, you know, is a like a ward or something of George Crowan in, the, in this uh, in this moment. Um, but by the time he's in Kentucky, you know, Crowan dies, I want to, George Crowan dies in like 1760. No, he dies shortly after the revolution. Um, and, and I believe, and so there's not the, um, um, so by the time Crow, uh, William Crowan is out here, like the, the connection is not very, very strong, but, mm. but yeah, there is that early family connection. Um, in the in the 50s 60s around there yeah okay fantastic I, I was wondering too we got a really great question here about um you know we we have this sort of understand this general understanding that a lot of these colonial officers particularly military officers are uh, sort of deeply invested in land speculation um out here uh, and we know that's certainly to be the case um you know once the the u.s becomes involved after the revolution but does that extend back into this this period of, of British colonial takeover? For sure, for sure. And so the, and so the, you know, a big part of what is driving Shawnee and Delaware willingness to, um, uh, to, to adopt this message that Neil Lynn is, um, is preaching is that they have been dispossessed in part by speculators in things like the walking purchase in the 1730s, where um, Pennsylvania, I mean, basically what happens is that Pennsylvania speculators uh, come up with this treaty that they say the Delaware signed. And the Delaware's like, yeah, we didn't sign that. And they're like, well, you should follow this. And you know, through coercion, they, they get an agreement and then they end up ceding the vast majority of their homelands in Pennsylvania. And then George, uh, George Crowan is, a land speculator also that's his i didn't mention that in that but that's one of his other sidelines in addition to being involved in the fur trade um and um and this becomes important in the illinois country also because after the proclamation of 1763 british speculators cannot buy land west of the appalachian mountains except in the illinois country because it's already it already has a colonial presence and so George Crowan is also involved with uh, the firm Bainton, Wharton, and Morgan in trying to get, uh, trying to accumulate land in the Illinois country that they can then sell. Um, so, yeah, everybody's involved in land speculation. Everywhere you turn, you can trip over a speculator. I find this really fascinating, and especially this narrative of of this pullback, right after after you know the 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 gulf that that we put everything into and nothing comes out of it. It's such an amazing quote, and you know in this these these you know sort of last decade before the revolution really kicks off, and of course Kentucky settlement then then follows on in that that gulf uh, decade. You know, is that does that British pullback um, really sort of lead to this? general understanding that gets promoted by people like, oh, I don't know, John Filson about Kentucky and the Ohio Valley being this, this open space 
right? That is that is free and available for the taking. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is that there is part of that for sure. Um, and you know, I mean, the the thing about the 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 early Ohio Valley settlers is that their understanding of ownership does not include native peoples, right? And so if the British are not there, then it's just kind of like, well, we can go here. Um, and so the, and, and so I do think that the, the, in many ways, the British pulling out of everything west of Fort Pitt in the early 1770s um, does set that stage. And the other thing that I'll add also is, um, that the British don't have the troops to maintain this, this barrier that the king announces in 1763, right? That I, there's a quote, um, I wish I could remember who it was from now, where I, I think someone says that it would, that even if the British had a million troops and a new Chinese wall, that they could not keep people from crossing the Appalachian Mountains. And, and, and so that's true, but even more than that, right, is that if you've abandoned the garrisons everywhere except Fort Pitt, then there's just not a presence of soldiers to enforce this law. And so there, then there's no way to stop the uh, people like Boone and others from crossing over. Um, there, and then you get to Dunmore's War, which is a whole different thing. But, you know, the, that I think that the lack of, of, of the presence of the British Empire certainly facilitates that that move into Kentucky by Virginians and North Carolinians and Pennsylvanians. We had a, a really uh, perceptive question that picked up on, you know, focusing on Pontiac and a prophet as, you know, what sort of, um, what sort of foreshadowing do these techniques of kinship and networking and coalition building, do we see sort of echoed again in Tecumseh a generation later? For sure, for sure. I mean, and so one thing that is important to know is that even after, um, even after Pontiac um, and Neolin kind of go off the scene after Pontiac's war, is that that uh, ideology uh, or theology doesn't really disappear, and so it continues to. Uh, to circulate. There's a resurgence in the 1770s, which then includes uh, Cherokees as well. Uh, and then, of course, the big resurgence is the one in, um, uh, in the first two decades of the 1800s with Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh. And the, the, the story that I love about uh, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa is that they were actually born in the Creek Nation. Their mother was Muscogee Creek. And uh, in 1811, Tecumseh takes his tour uh, from the Ohio Valley down into the south. He visits the Choctaws, he visits uh, Creeks, he visits Osages. Um, and the only nation that seems to pick up on this ideology uh, is, uh, is part of the Muscogee Nation, the part of the Muscogee Creeks. Um, and if I remember correctly, Tecumseh gives his speech to the Muscogee Nation at the village where his mother was born, right? And so there, there's clearly a, a, a kinship connection in that instance as well. The Choctaws are like, yeah, we're not, we're not interested in this. But you have a faction of Creeks who do take up this ideology, uh, which leads to the Red Stick War um, that's you know, kind of parallel to the War of 1812. We've had a couple of questions and I really appreciate um, when we get these questions that, that want to know more about um, the archives and, and where you had to go to piece together this narrative and, and what sort of challenges, um, you know, this sort of research and writing presents. So, you know, I, you know, doing, re doing a research project that involves four different empires is, um, it presents, it does present some remarkable challenges. Um, and so on the, on the positive side though, is you get to spend time in places like Southern France where the French colonial archives are located. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time uh, one summer going through the, through the records there. Um, um, the, the British colonial records are a little more dispersed. Um, the, the big archive that I used for those is actually in the, um, 
uh, is at the University of Michigan. That's where Thomas Gage's papers are. Um, but but part of what I'm I, I have to do here is is I'm going through these colonial records is that there, you know, no very rarely do people come out and say this is happening because these two people are related. Right. Usually what's happened is they'll talk about the, the, you know, they'll talk about native peoples doing different things. And then you only slowly begin to piece together. Oh, this person they're talking about over here is the brother of this person. This person is married to this person. And so the, the way that I learned that uh, Pontiac had married an Illinois woman, for example, is that in 1768, he um, gets um, basically interrogated by some British officials uh, who want to know why he's coming to the Illinois country. And he says, I'm, I'm coming to visit my wife's brothers. And that's the only record that Pontiac has this marriage. Uh, and so a lot of it is trying to sift through these uh, documents and trying to figure, up, figure out how uh, people are connected. Um, I'll also say that the first part of the book is largely based on archaeology, which is a whole different set of um, uh, set of materials, and and that's and that requires a whole different way of thinking about how to understand connections between communities when what you're using is basically the the things that they discarded, um, using ceramics to understand similarities between um, production styles and those sorts of things. That's, that's really fantastic. And, and personally, for me in reading the book, those were my favorite chapters. They were the ones that really sort of captivated me. And, and yeah, um, I, would, uh, I would remind all of our listeners that we do have uh, a donation link um, in the chat. So if you haven't already and you've appreciated um, what we've had tonight, please go check that out. I'll, uh, I'll throw uh, one more uh, Filson-centric collection or question to you. Um, having spent a, a great deal of time with Colonel Ruben Durrett, um, if he was going to write your book, how would it have been different? <laughs> um, well, it would have started with Daniel Boone and uh, rather than in the 1300s. And um, well, maybe. No, no Prince I mean, Madoc? Yeah, yeah, it might have, might have started with Prince Madoc. Um, I actually, um, uh, I do want to, to, to give a shout out to, to one Filson collection though, um, which, which I, I think answers your, your previous question a little bit more. Um, and um, this also is thanks to Jim Holmberg who directed me to this source. Um, but the other kind of thing that I, that I pieced together was um, using a, an account book um, in the Filson's collections that it, it really demonstrated the connections between after the Louisiana Purchase between traders in, and merchants in Louisville with the, the French uh, and Spanish traders in, um, in St. Louis and helped me understand how those economic networks were developing. When really the, you know, the entry is not like, I'm doing this because I'm related to so-and-so, but it's like, oh, this person is buying bison hides from this other person. And I can begin to piece together these networks in that way. Um, I don't believe that's the kind of thing that Durrett would write. It'd mostly be about, um, Boone and George Rogers Clark and the uh, all of the, the the illustrious figures of Kentucky's past. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, that's a great way to to end it in uh, in Filson uh, past and and present. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to all the audiences um, on both Zoom and Facebook for being with us. We had some really great questions tonight, and I really appreciate the uh, the audience engagement. Everybody have a great night. Thanks, everybody.